Welcome to the Future of Tourism podcast. I'm David Peacock. Stop owning your own content. Young leaders are stepping up. Bring everyone to the table. And imagine their world anew. Expressing need for destinations to communicate their authentic state of being has never been more apparent. The African-American story in America is one that has been told many ways with many wrinkles. The challenge now is to tell it authentically and openly in a way that acknowledges the pain and also the genius and resilience of people. Benish Brown is the CEO of Destination Augusta, Georgia. He's a friend and a peer, and I admire immensely his continual work, not just to drive the shareability of Augusta, but to empower and ennoble the people who live there. Joe Venito is an interesting character in the tourism world. He founded the Venito Collaboratory nearly three decades ago, with a specific focus on working at a granular level with destination stakeholders to create authentic experiences. The results speak for themselves. Good morning, Benish. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Good morning, David. Uh, I'm in Augusta, Georgia, uh, a city where it's been my home now for the past five years. We have had a great summer, and uh, I'm excited from my team standpoint. We're diving into our first year of a three-year strategic plan, so our work is laid out for us. We're, we'll be prepared for any uh, opportunities that might come to change that, but uh, we're excited to be here, and I am just honored and thrilled to be uh, here to have a conversation with you and another icon that I know you're going to introduce that's, that's joining us. So thank you so much. Well, well thank you you very much for that. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Um, um, I will introduce that other icon, that guy is Joe Venito. Um, Joe, I have a question for you. Um, here's a quote for you. Deep enriching experiences are the currency of 21st century travel, and the demand is being driven by consumers. Joe Venito, do you have any idea who said that? I think I do. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, David, for quoting me. Uh, I'm super excited to be with you this morning, and also with Benish. Uh, it's certainly a privilege to be with two gentlemen I admire and talking about uh, authentic experiences and destination development, two of my favorite topics. Well, very good. Yeah, the quote was from a podcast you did with Andreas Wiesenborn and Ben Switzer on a continuum of experiential development in a digital world. It was about, about eight months ago. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for allowing me to quote me. And you... <laughs> I, I just want to see if you even recognized it. All right. Benish, it's good to see you. We were just talking before. You've just finished the second Destination Next uh, survey in six years. Yes, uh, exactly. My predecessor uh, did what I called uh, DNEX 1.0, which gave us at least a benchmark uh, to look at. And, uh, you know, through time, it, I felt like it might have sat there just a bit. We knew last year after I'd been here for three, three and a half years, it was time for us to reset. You know, we've come through the turbulent times all of us faced and we were like, where do we go now? And I thought a great starting point would be, let's do DNEX now. Let's see where we where we were six years ago. What does DNEX tell us now? And my, my ultimate goal, David, is to make sure this needle moves significantly uh, in the next three years. We're giving ourselves until 2025 uh, to do another assessment and uh, it's so interesting, and because the topic we're talking about, I notice now in this next version of DNEX, uh, it's even moved up higher. We see that in, it, it, you know, a priority is really tying communities to those authentic experiences, those immersive experiences. That has just gone up in popularity with what consumers want. So we're very much focused on that. I have some more history I can speak about to how we've gotten to where we are now. But uh, yeah, for us, it's really moving forward. DNEXT has allowed us to align with this community, really hear the voice of this community, and always say, you know, you, 
You listen for the opportunities that come for the, from your community and figure out how to exploit those opportunities. That's where we spend our time. How do we exploit what our people are saying is important to them? Well, I, I really do appreciate um, the work, though, that goes in behind it. You're, Benish, one of the things I like when I hear strategy in the context of uh, DNEXT and, and the work that you're doing is you put it into practice. And, and a real example of that is um, in your 2017 strategy, the idea of developing experiential links and using it to connect to the community was in there as a strategy piece. But let's let's be frank, you know, so much of strategy doesn't survive the photocopier, right? We, we see it all the time. And, and I'm, yes. I'm really, when you say you're doing D-Next, I also know you're connecting with your community and you're using it that way. So let's go back to that strategy piece, experiential development in Augusta. Why was that important? Why is that important? It, it does so many things. It's complicated, but why is it important part of the strategy? Tell us about that. Why did you zero in on it? it and I'll tell you from the, the the, the product you're talking about was called um, Destination Blueprint. And Destination Blueprint was specifically designed to say, if here are some things Augusta really needs to consider to, ele to continue elevating itself as a competitive destination for visitors, which also enhances a place where people want to live. And one of the analysis that came out is that Augusta has an opportunity to now for, for, for our experiences to uh, you know, shift from the show and tell. And there's a quote, you are so great with quotes. There's a quote that we all have heard in some version that says, you know, tell me, I'll forget it. Teach me, I'll remember it, but involve me, involve me and I'll, I'll learn it. And it was basically saying, Augusta, you have the opportunity to really um, combine experiences of some of your assets that your assets are kind of working in silos. You have some great opportunities of things that are totally unique about Augusta that you can combine and compile and make these very profound opportunities that people will, uh, will travel to Augusta to experience, to immerse themselves. And I'm not sure at that point we use the word immerse. We came upon the word immersive experiences when we started going to uh, this collaboratory experience. My team went, and we can talk more about this later, I'll just shorten this. My team went to a few of those collaboratory experiences, came back with great ideas. Oh, wow, here's how we can get some of our assets, our museums, our, and we're working now with some nonprofits and for-profit entities to, to that for the experiences we have built. But I'll tell you when the light bulb went off, David, we went maybe three times. I finally had the light bulb moment when I said, we can come back and talk to our attractions as much as we want, tell them how this idea sounds. Let's take them. They need to go and feel this. And they went to Louisville and the rest is history. Well, that, that is a fantastic intro. Joe, I think you've been set up for a win here. Um, so there, there's the reason behind it. But walk us through a little bit of, of, of what, the, what the, the, uh, the, the lab is about. Tell us about how it's set up. We've got a, we had a great setup from Benish of why it's important. Now, you captured his attention, I think, with the Louisville work, but how does it work? Yeah, so what we did about a dozen years ago, uh, we, we had requests from destinations throughout North America to really see our work. And what we did was we created this three-day immersive experience called the Experience Lab that we host every year. And what we do is we bring DMO execs in. They can bring their attraction partners in. Sometimes it's economic development folks. But they come into a community where we've created what I call unforgettable experiences, these engaging and immersive experiences. And what we do is for three days, they're immersed in a little bit of our process. How does it work? How does a destination facilitate the development of unforgettable experiences? And we walk them through that, but at the same time, we do what I call mobile workshops. And what they do is they literally, as customers, are immersed in about six or seven different mobile workshops. And what we do is we sort of pull the curtain back and we talk about how these experiences were developed. 
And the experiences are sometimes, as Benish says, with nonprofits, for profits, solopreneurs, et cetera. And again, it's, it's a proof of concept because destinations in many cases know they need to do it. In most cases, to your point and Benish's point, people are doing strategic plans and master plans and this destination development piece, it's, it's like a black hole. Nobody knows how to do this. And the experience lab really shows this proof of concept. And my hope is that when you come in and see the lab, you're looking at at least seven attractions that three or four of them are gonna resonate because you're gonna to say to yourself, well, we have arts, we have historic sites, we have museums, we have breweries or culinary venues. So, so Joe, let me understand this. There's an experience lab in the late fall this year, right? Is that correct? Yes. So our, our newest uh, destination lab is going to be November 6th through the 8th, and it's going to be in Scottsdale. And Scottsdale, the city and experience Scottsdale, the CBB, um, just underwent two different rounds of experiential development. And the interesting thing about Scottsdale is that it's a very developed destination. And so people might think, well, if Scottsdale is a really developed destination, why do they need it? They need it to stay competitive. Their goal was increasing competitive advantage in a tourism world where people are looking for sure, what else sure. is new. And so, so the, you're going to, when people are in Scottsdale, you'll have five or six things to take them to that are developed experiences that they can talk about the beginning of that idea, how they built it, what it does. Yes, exactly. Okay, so, so but but I can tell you why Scottsdale needs it, like any place needs it. You could say Augusta's been here for you know, centuries, literally, but there's a story that's missing from Augusta, and that's what we're gonna. That's what I want to talk about now, Ben. Is yep. the stories that are missing. The Scottsdale story. It's it's a magnificent place in its current moment. I don't get a whole lot of its history when I'm there, and I really do want to understand it. You know, the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings that are so proximate, the the history of the desert. I, I often end up in Arizona. I say to myself. How did this place exist, Phoenix, before electricity? But it did. It did. You know, this is the fascinating part. So let's yeah. come back to the authentic part. Benish, I saw you do a little bit of an intro. The day the day you kicked off the lab, you couldn't be there. And you wrote, you did this cool little video for the participants. You were off in, I think, the state capitol or somewhere. And you talked about being selected as one of the 10 for the intake for, for, for the experience lab. How did you do that? How did you sort of engage your, your community of, of stakeholders and supporting businesses and, and NFTs and interest groups and movements. And then how did you whittle it down? What did that process look like? Yeah, um, we, uh, again, had been attending the lab. So we had a sense of who were, you know, who was coming to the labs and having success. We saw in other communities and it ranged from, you know, museums to, uh, activities, outdoor activities, but we internally talked about the things that both needed help to help grow and some of the activities that were already really producing really well and that could certainly still tie to these experiences. So internally, you know, we, we definitely wanted to help our ongoing uh, partners, uh, our museums, our arts and cultural activities, I guess I would say, because that was pointed out very heavily in that original destination master plan. It said, you know, to elevate your community and to elevate the experiences, help your arts and culture uh, assets to be more than show and tell. So we, we thought about them, do we work with all of them? And uh, they, as we worked with those products, it gave us maybe seven or eight of our members, we wanted to round it out at 10. And we, that's when we, we switched to some for profits that already had some things uh, working, but the, we knew who we wanted to participate. We didn't know exactly what was the depth of the story that each of these would tell. And that's when we knew we needed some of the expertise of Joe, because David, there, you know, obviously some of these assets, some of these uh, uh, entities were doing the same things for years and years. They were very set. Mm -hmm. And 
a lot of cases, and we know this exists across uh, across the breadth of, of our tourism industry, where sometimes all that matters is that the turnstiles are turning. And we don't care a lot more than that, but we really need to dive a lot more, be authentic, as Joe said, be a lot more competitive. And if you look at the top trends, 50 trends in this year's DNEX, number two is customers increasingly are seeking unique, authentic travel experiences. We began to drill that home and we had Joe to come to do a secret shopping. And Joe was very careful, but very honest with what looked good and just what needed to have that shot in the arm. Um, and it just required a lot of work, but things that are, are, are worth having are worth working for. And we identified the top 10, and I'll tell you, there are a few in, the, in our 10 that I just didn't expect, and we can talk about it later. One is a water, our water treatment area uh, facility at the Fantasy Nature Park. Nobody had ever seen fantasy through the eyes of this makes a great experience for people to not only learn about how Augusta's water is processed, but you get a lot of hands on with doing um, you know, activities that you'll go back home and you'll never forget it. So right. Joe can cover, I think, a lot of those. And that I don't think there's an opportunity probably in any other city in our region. I won't say there's not. So a lot of the things we're doing, I think, truly do make us competitive particularly in our regional footprint, our competitive footprint, there are a lot of things that make us competitive across this country and maybe even globally. And we can talk later about the story of the black caddies. That probably is our crown jewel. Well, and, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up because there is also the idea of telling stories that haven't been told for a long time. Joe, you've got a keen eye for this. If you spend two decades literally in experiential development, you start to see the little gems that you say, oh my gosh, this is so incredibly important, but it's not being shared and it's not crafted. So one of the things I know from working myself in experiential development for a couple of decades is the nurture after the fact is so important. When you work with a stakeholder, an operator to develop something, it's like skateboarding. They're going to get better at it, you know, incrementally at first, and then there's going to be a steep slope. But if you're not there to support them, sometimes they run out of steam in month number three and they, ah, oh, no one's coming to my bootlegger experience. And we put so much work into it. And it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with the experience. It's the other part of that, the backfill, the social media sharing. Tell me about that side of it. How, how do you prepare them for that reality? So for us, we we have a, a seven month process, which is uh, which is really hands on, and it's really unique to what we do. So we come into a destination, work with the team, uh, the executive team or the management team. Uh, in in this case, uh, two amazing women uh, on Benish's team, Jennifer Bowen and Sarah Childers, and all of the partners. And what I like to say is the first five months of the project is really all about developing the the experience which is the the stories and the design and the storyboarding and the scripting and then the last two months we focus on sales and marketing and you know the the sales and marketing pieces some organizations are already doing it well but we want to make sure that every organization that all boats are rising and that everybody has the same capacity and capability and so what happens at this at this point is the bureaus come in and Augusta's marketing team is amazing. And what they'll do is they work to help create, you know, assets, digital assets, but the partners do the same thing. So it's a, it's a shared process at that point when everything is, is launched and then the team works together to schedule these experiences. So for us, the experiences are on board for on board and available they're at least twice a month for leisure visitors and locals. And then over and above that, they're also available for any type of group that comes in. So uh, if you've got uh, a convention, a meeting, a family reunion, a destination wedding, any of those, those are also uh, you know, perfect opportunities for these experiences. And so you know, in terms of Benish and his team, they not only have 10 great new unforgettable experiences, 
but they've got a new story to tell because they've elevated the experiences and they've really uncovered these experiences and their stories. Um, ultimately, the goal when you create these experiences is to convert your customer, whoever that may be, into a brand ambassador. You know, the key with a story is that I'm going to remember it and recount it to somebody else. And but, but Joe, it's not, and then don't sell it short though, because it's not just a story. It becomes, as as Ben has said, if you if you teach me, I'll, it'll become part of me, and I'll never forget. It's beyond the story, isn't it? Yes, and that's that's why we talk about experiences in terms of engaging and immersive. Mm -hmm. So, give you a real quick snapshot. Not to say that you can nail all ten, Joe, but give me a quick snapshot of the Experience Lab stuff in um, in Augusta. So, so in Augusta, I mean, I we looked at the essence of Augusta, right? Uh, you you talk about destination DNA. I look at essence, and when we think about essence of a place, I mean, I, I look at sort of the broad categories. I look at arts. I look at history, right? I look at um, you know a, the culinary scene. Um, I also look at uh, you know one of Augusta's uh, favorite sons, right? Uh, James Brown. So you look at that and, and, and you get what I call categories of experiences, right? And then from there, you can sort of drill down. Uh, but if we look at some of these experiences, you know, Finizzi Nature Park, um, amazing. And you become a citizen scientist. You know, you put waders on, you do water sample testing, and you meet the scientists. I mean, this was something that people were just kind of walking around the park and, oh, they were doing some things to keep the water safe. But, I mean, this is an immersive experience, which is amazing. The other one uh, that I'll talk about is, is the Morris Museum of Art. So mystery at the Morris. So the Morris Museum, amazing collection of Southern art. And we went in and we looked at this art, but we looked at it through a different lens because Mr. Morris, who donated the art, was a newspaper guy. And so what we did is we overlaid, you know, this experience with story and using sort of uh, a technique from improv. Like you walk into the museum to learn about the highlights of the Morris Museum. And all of a sudden, as a docent is explaining the first painting, there's a guy in the corner who says, wait a minute, she's not telling you the whole story. And, and what they do is they, 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 the, this guy hijacks the tour from the tour guide and you're learning all of these, like it's the most amazing experience in an art museum. Sounds fantastic. And with, I'll add with that, the nod to Mr. Morris and his background in the media is that this interrupter is a reporter. Right, it's, it's his style. Okay, um, we're, we're, we're getting a little longer on time here, Benish. In what's the word in market from from your stakeholders? You know, you've rallied them around these 10 things. And what's the word from the visitors? Tell us how it works. It is a source of pride. Absolutely. I will start even with my board. My board chair works for Textron. They make probably half the uh, golf carts across the country and all of the specialty vehicles. But he was hosting some team members from Textron, uh, again, from a, across their footprint. And he made sure they engaged in three of our um, immersive experiences. A lot of them had never been to Augusta before. They came back to him and reported that these were some of the three most remarkable opportunities they've ever had. They absolutely loved Augusta because of that. He is now a, an amazing champion. Had my board meeting this morning, ask about the priorities as we go into 2024, continuing to nurture our Authentic Augusta experiences is a priority of my board. That's how much they love it. Wow. And, and that's what I say when I say, when you talk to Benish about strategy, you know, don't take your sneakers off because the next thing is to put it into action. So yeah. I am I am so excited to hear that. From the visitor side, what's the feedback? Visitor side, the experience is so much better. I will pick on and I'll just say this one up. To, we have the home of the boyhood home of Woodrow Wilson. Very much show and tell. Now the interaction is Woodrow's mom is meets you at the door and, you know, she talks about her son and then she also introduces her neighbor, who's the uh, mother of a soon to be Supreme Court justice of the time. And but all of these, they bring you in with a little snack, maybe something to drink. But the change in the way people are uh, introduced to the Woodrow Wilson home. 
uh, gets a lot of conversation. So it's it has been transformational for us. I'll tell that. Proud, uh, we're very proud, and I appreciate your question to Joe. You can't just push these out and not support them. We are in this for the long haul. These partners still need us. We are going to be here to help those partners uh, get through this this initial period of these uh, of these experiences. Well, you know, you you said something and it just triggered something. I mean, I've been working with with people like Joe and Edge of the Wedge and Tourism Cafe for a number of years and Destination Thing and it just hit me that it becomes an experience when it's granular, when I have an interaction with another human being that's on a one-on-one, -on -one, one on two, you know, the old, you know, take us through the fort and one person lectures, lectures 20 people. That's not experiential. That's a walking lecture. So it's this granularity again, because you, you talked about the exchange, you know, coming, you have a little snack and every experiential thing I've ever been to is kind of starts with that. Something you break the ice and make it personal. Um, Joe, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, again, you 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 want to create that connection with the customer. And sometimes that's done over breaking bread. Sometimes it's done over a compelling story. Um, you know, sometimes it's done over a story that's been never told. And that's the case with Augusta's Black Caddies. Um, I will say that, you know, the Lucy Craft Laney Museum, uh, African-American Museum in Augusta, what the chair of the board was at the Louisville lab two or three years ago, and he saw the experience of the black jockeys that were connected to the Kentucky Derby. And at the end of that, he stood up, he turned to me and he said, oh, but I have a story for you. <laughs> and and I said, okay, I mean, I wasn't knowing this and I'm, I'm gonna defer this to Benish to talk about the black caddies. That is probably the most emotional story I have. I'll make this quick. I know we're short on time, but Augusta has this rich, I call the caddies the invisible uh, force that's been on that golf course for 30 years, uh, where gentlemen at the end of the week try on this green jacket, but you don't know the backstory of who guided them with every putt they made, names like Jack Nicholas, you know, uh, Tiger Woods, actually, and these caddies with creative names, Burnt Biscuit, Cigarette, Cemetery. Um, and the, the what we do have, we still have some living caddies who there are stories that are, uh, you, you know, we have actors that relay some firsthand stories, but the value to the attendees is at the end of the presentation, they actually get to converse with a caddy that lived the experience. Wow. I mean, that that's so powerful. I and mean, we, we have those kind of people up here. I think of the fishing guides I know who who were born, you know, in, in the 1930s. And there's the yes. last of them. And they take you on that trip. That that's super okay. We're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Joe, you're talking to probably you're talking about. 3,000 people and 900 destinations worldwide. Any thoughts or advice as we roll into the fall in 2023? Yeah, I would say that the, the D-Next Future Study really uh, confirms that destination development is key. And what I would say is many times executives and CEOs are thinking, about destination development at 40,000 feet. You know, they get a master plan and, and they're thinking infrastructure and strategic plan and all that. But what I want to invite people to think about is I want you to come down to 10,000 feet with me because at 10,000 feet, there is such an opportunity for destinations to create these unique experiences collaboratively with the DMO and to do it in such a way that it really impacts both the visitor and the organization and the businesses. And I will tell you, it's done without drilling holes, mixing cement, or 20 years of debt service. Oh, well, well put. Okay, last word to you, Vettish Brown. Thank you. I'll just simply say, I know every destination wants to consistently raise the bar. We knew we needed to raise the bar in Augusta. We didn't know how to do it. We knew what we wanted to do. We didn't know the how. When those two came together, when we knew the what, Joe came in to show us how this authentic Augusta experience has truly raised the bar and we'll keep building and building from this. It has made a huge difference for us, David. 
Well, I'll tell you, it's a real pleasure to get to work with both of you. Thanks for being here and best of luck on your journeys. Ciao.